a little time for questions now, and then we'll move into the sections that I discussed. And, you know, you've all been here for nine days, and you've made lots of alliances and so on. So we're hoping that we can build on some of those connections, but also the ones that relate to your uh, subject positions, as it were, so that that will be fruitful. But I wonder if we've got some questions or comments for Paula for uh, what was a, another bravura paper. Thank you, Paula. That was, that was terrific. Um, I wanted to ask you sort of a, a macro question to go back to the point you started, but from which, for me, a number of methodological issues derive. You started by quoting my colleague Anna Singh uh, and her reference to um, a distinction between an inclination in the humanities towards a general abstraction that makes political economy of the capitalism is one thing all over the world amenable whereas uh, uh, the social sciences would be much more specific and open to the historic singularity. And this is striking from someone who would claim history as part of the humanities. And, and it's probably, for me, uh, just the fact that Anna is speaking as an anthropologist. Um, because in the humanities, we often make the opposite claims, thinking of other social sciences, not anthropology. We make the claim that it is uh, um, history and literature and the good critical philosophy that pays attention to singularity while keeping the big frame in mind. Whereas the social sciences, especially, specifically the dominant ones, economics, are the ones that uh, uh, promulgate the discourses of universal market, universal subjectivity, uh, uh, capitalism as a universal good thing. So, starting from there, I wanted to ask you, uh, what is granted, what is given up in terms of critical power when the critical insistence of the critic, you, is to say, let's make modernity specific because India has a particular historical trajectory as opposed to the Western modernity, which is then granted as homogeneous, singular, mm -hmm. and uh, almost ahistorical. Or basically, I'm trying to refer to this. Mm -hmm. There are critiques of Western modernity mm -hmm. that make colonialism and slavery an integral part of the development of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that it's not like there are countries that were colonized for which the Western receipt doesn't work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. is that the Western receipt doesn't work for the Western world mm -hmm. because the Western world was from the beginning, this is the, you know, the quijano sure, Wallerstein sure. argument, sure. Um, was from the beginning a world of capitalism fully enmeshed with colonialism and slavery. Okay. Um, what, what derives from that, for me, for your argument, mm -hmm. is questions such as if call centers mm -hmm. and IT development are such a minuscule or small portion of the Indian economy, mm -hmm. what functions nationally and globally does the discourse of the modern India or the contemporary India predicated on the radical importance of these call centers and IT industries play globally? For example, that's a question that, that comes to mind for me once I, I, I step outside the framework that India is all by itself in a historical specificity while the West is all by itself in a historical specificity. So this is a question about neoliberalism mm -hmm. as a totalizing um, form of capitalism, as a r truly global form of mm -hmm. capitalism that is nurtured by these, times, uh, by these types of occlusions. Right. OK. Well, there's several parts to your question. And I, um, let, me, let me start with the first, first part, with the Singh and humanities. And you're right, history belongs to the humanities. Um, the first thing is, Singh is referring to critical studies, right? So she's not talking about the dominant social sciences, which of course we can all acknowledge as uh, both celebrating and assuming that uh, 
you know, neoliberalism. First of all, they wouldn't even recognize neoliberalism as a concept, per se. But anyway, she's talking specifically about debates within critical social sciences and humanities about globalization. And I think she's, she, she does strike upon something that is interesting, which is that there has been, in at least the more celebrated uh, works on globalization, um, this notion of capitalism functioning um, without without a historical specificity in certain works. And I think Harda Negri, for example, is a good example um, of that kind of critique. Um, and she is also, ref you know, the, the scholars that she refers to, whether it's Timothy Mitchell or James Ferguson or Doreen Massey, are not, um, you know, the voices of dominant social sciences by any means. And anthropological, as you know, with anthropology departments closing down around the country, that it is hardly a social science that is, um, uh, you know, being coveted by universities looking for, for funded research opportunities. Um, so I think for me the issue is not you know, who is better at history, humanities, or social sciences. I'm not, you know, being in media studies, coming from a discipline that is intellectually, you know, um, always, always, always already suffering from a crisis of confidence. Um, I'm not concerned about whether or not humanities has more history or social sciences has more history. To me, the issue is, um, how are debates about globalization and social change framed in ways that, you know, disciplines often talk past each other, you know? And so um, for me, you know, I approach the information society in the Indian context through narratives of development. And this is not unique, as I said from the beginning, to India, but to much of the global south, you know? And this, this idea of, of the relationship between communication technology, science, and modernization um, is not a is not a very common frame, you know, in 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 studies and cultural in cultural studies and media studies. And I think it is. I think that I've actually found um, critical cultural anthropological work that critiques development, whether it's Escobar, who I you know am less in agreement with, or Singh, or Ferguson, or even um, you know uh, work by political scientists who are at the fringe of their own uh, s programs, like Timothy Mitchell, et cetera, I find this kind of work more useful because they are talking about questions that matter in the global south in a, in a sort of larger macro context. So that was my, that was the, that was where I was kind of entering this debate. Um, the latter part of your question, and I'd like to, I feel like I've talked too much, and so I'd like to open it up to a little, a few more questions, and I want to continue this. I mean, this is a, a very big question. Um, the, I am not making the point, you know, I, this is an argument, this is a critique of post-colonial studies, you know, this, this, no, what you're saying, which is that, you know, if you are arguing that India is distinct and the West is di distinct, um, you know, you, this is the kind of the critique that's made of the Beish Chakravarti's work, for example. Um, what I'm arguing is that when we think about um, when we think about these debates about the information society and labor in particular, the frame of reference, what counts as politics in the Indian context, is often missed. Right? If our focus is basically looking at our call center workers organizing, are there conditions of work? you know, better or worse than American call center workers? You know, are jobs moving um, past workers um, every time they get together and organize? Those are important questions, and I'm by no means am I saying that this doesn't matter. I'm saying that there's something else going on in the Indian context. Um, and what is going on in the Indian context? I'm not making an argument for Indian exceptionalism, which, you know, post-colonial scholars are sometimes accused of. In fact, they're accused of Bengali exceptionalism, because 90% of subalternists are, you you know, Bengali, that's why many of us share the same last name. But the, um, th the point here is that we, what we miss, you know, in um, thinking about labor and the information economy by defining the social actors involved based on the experiences in Silicon Valley um, is the larger struggles that are actually happening. And I actually think what's happening in, in India, and I can, you know, talk more about this, there are, there's resonance, you know, across much of the developing world, especially in emerging economies, as I mentioned, you know, the, the politics around affirmative action in Brazil, for example, is an easy comparison that one can make between um, 
the politics of reservation and, and race. So I, I'm not, if I did give the impression that this is about India's exceptionalism and what we have to do with by fo you know, focusing on the Indian case, that wasn't my intention. I know this is a critique that's made of post-colonial studies. But I think this is a discussion we should, we should definitely um, uh, continue. Uh, thanks for a great presentation, Paula. I have so many questions. <laughs> I'm not going to ask any of them, <laughs> just uh, maybe uh, two questions. Um, one is a methodological question that once has already started, the problem of generalization. Mm -hmm. uh, in, I see this in political economy, the framework of, uh, the framework of media slash communication mm -hmm. is itself a huge generalization. So um, it relates directly to my work because you know there are so many newspapers taking up so many positions, and um, as Bordeaux says, the field of cultural production is uh, characterized by processes of distinction, as well as you know processes of mimetic uh, isomorphism. So if we are dealing with such a complex field of cultural production, mm -hmm. how do we jump to the level of media and communication? How do we offer that criticism? That's question number one. The second one is more like a comment uh, when we were talking about the aspirations, mm -hmm. you know, which have a great symbolic force in India. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, in your own work, you've shown the material materiality of aspirations. Yeah. You know, how this can influence municipal budgets and national budgets. How a large portion of these budgets are allocated for high-tech infrastructure. You know, so the materiality of uh, aspirations should probably be considered uh, as well. And the third point is about the grooming, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, exercises mm -hmm. in some of the high-tech industries mm -hmm. in India. And uh, I, I, in fact, wanted to say this when Angela McRobby gave a beautiful presentation here. You know, in call centers, we notice that uh, grooming is offered as part of managing. I mean, it, it is actually offered as pleasure. Mm -hmm. And th this is what I was telling Kiju yesterday. And it is a way of managing labor. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, uh, you know, conditions of work are uh, extremely poor there. They have to work night shifts. So this virtual dislocation, you know, um, uh, 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 is offered as pleasure in the sense that uh, an opportunity to interact with a different cultural world, this provides some kind of dislocation, some kind of displacement from their actual conditions. Right. So this is managed to you know, uh, kind of you know, keep the labor happy. Sure. So th this is one point. And my last point is a very short point on this little film, this karma. It's fascinating because uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, the same Sanskrit shloka, mm -hmm. uh, it is, of course, uh, it comes from Bhagavad Gita, right. very innocent and extremely uh, beautiful you know, epic. And, uh, yeah. and it, it's taken out of the context and the way leftists were appropriating this. You know, it, it says that karma ne vadhikara has, um, adhikara has ma kadachana, which means your job is only to labor and not to expect the fruits of your labor. Right. This is what it says. But the leftists were saying that it's a feudal and it's a capitalist, you know, a way of uh, exploiting the labor. And today we use the same to celebrate capitalism. And right. I, I was just finding this contrast extremely fascinating. Yeah. Thank you so much. Again, in the interest of just hearing a few more um, points, Sahana, I'll just maybe answer one of your very well-informed um, and uh, well-articulated points. Of course, you're someone who um, has also been studying many of these processes that I'm referring to in great detail. The materiality aspect um, is something I, you know, as you probably know from my work, I, I deal with in, in, in great length. But um, for the purposes of this presentation, I wanted to talk a bit more about the symbolic politics here. Um, clearly, there are material consequences, not just at the municipal level, at the national level, um, to the struggles over access to employment and educational um, um, rights, you know, and economic rights in general. And that's something I hope to talk about a little bit more tomorrow, which is um, this notion of pedagogic development that you see happening in these industries. You know? so, um, whether they're Indian industries like Infosys and uh, you know Azim Premji's uh, company, or whether they're uh, you know global um, companies like Microsoft and Hewlett Packard, all of these companies have gotten into the business of development. You know they're not just corporations anymore; they're actually part of governance institutions. You know, and so th there is a real materiality into in terms of um, the implications of that work. Um, I think the the point of yours that I would just like to respond to quickly is um, the first point that you made about communications and what makes communications 
if, if I understand your question correctly, why are we looking at this issue through the lens of communications? Is that what you're saying? In, in terms of why is our focus media studies? How is that something that is universal across these different sites? No? Am I missing your question? OK. I see. OK. I see. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, that is a bigger question, you know, um, for sure. I mean, I feel that, you know, for me, um, my own work has always looked at this kind of other aspect of the media in the global south, which is um, the pedagogic aspect of the media, you know, which has been in the field of development. You know, um, when we think of media in the Indian context, we think of commercial media these days. You know, we think of the cultural industries in various forms. Um, there is, this, con this connects to the, your last point about grooming. Increasingly, in the arena of development communication, there's a recognition that pleasure is the way that we get to teaching people the benefits of education and uh, access to technology. Um, and so there's actually a meeting of those worlds um, happening, right? And so you have telecenters in India, which are basically excuses to show Bollywood films or Bollywood videos um, to women and men and you know, young people who usually don't have time or access. Um, and so there is a, a merging of those worlds um, that's worth thinking about. Um, but what makes this, um, what makes, brings those different levels together is I think a larger, larger, uh, larger question. But the point, the points you raise are each worth commenting on. But I'd like to hear from a few other people. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've just got a quick sort of naive question and a comment. Um, my sort of inner geographer was thrilled when you put up a map because we, you know, it's the first map we've had because <laughs> I got very excited about that. And I just wanted to ask you really about the kind of geography of the information society in, in, in India and the degree to which, I suppose, Saskia Sassen's work or something like that would argue right. that information societies reproduce the existing privileged geography of, of industrial societies in many ways. And I was just wondering whether that was the case in India or whether we've seen the creation of a new geography uh, as, a, as a result of, um, of the information society and also how that tied into the kind of politics really, the governance systems in a very federal system like India. Right. So that was a question. And my comment was just a lovely mirror image that came up at the end of your talk when you were talking about global elites um, wanting sort of national languages, wanting local languages to be spoken by everybody else but the, while, while equipping their own children with English. Right. And it's a fantastic mirror image of the global north where right. sort of middle class liberals want their children to learn Catalan Chinese. or Catalan yeah. or w Irish or Welsh or yeah. their historic language yeah. while knowing full well that they're equipped with the global language right. and the cultural capital of sort of English or Spanish or whatever it is. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting comment. Um, in terms of the geography of India's information society, yeah, it's very much um, changed and in some ways reinforced divisions that existed before. Um, one is, of course, in India, the parts of India that are not part of the information economy, you know, a big chunk in the middle of the country, you know, the, the north central part of India, the north and northeast, um, have seen, you know, plummeting rates of growth. Um, compared to the rest of India. And so when we think about globalized India, it's a very regionally south and west India. You know, you see Gujarat, Maharashtra, and then south India is where you see the, the sort of fastest rates of growth. And then you see exclusion and, and, and lack of growth. The other thing that you see, um, you know, at the, at the local level, of course, you see many of the processes that I'm sure you've talked about, you know, the kind of the malls, the gated communities, um, the, the division of, of local spaces. At the same time as you have growing expansion of informal housing, you know, slums, um, in, in all of India's mega cities, um, the percentage of people who live in informal housing um, which are slums, um, are anywhere between, you know, 40% to 60%, you know. And so that, that is a continued uh, reality in India today. Um, and then the other, the other interesting uh, geographical uh, uh, point of reference here is that increasingly what you have in India are states competing with each other to be the next, you know, to be the next Bangalore. So the state that I'm doing, um, I have been doing, uh, you know, more ethnographic field work in is West Bengal which is the, you know, which has been the communist state for the last 30 years, you know. And so uh, Calcutta and West Bengal is trying to transform itself as the next Bangalore, you know. And so there is this, there is this uh, regional competition. And, and really to understand how globalization works in India, you do have to sort of look at the region, the city. Um, and there is no notion of like, you know, this is happening across India at all, yeah. 
Yeah, thank you for a very informative uh, presentation. Uh, both my indirect and direct sort of witnessing of India sort of confirms with what you've presented. But I have a question regarding the circulation of labor, or what somebody, some people call displacement of labor, sure. and uh, cross-cultural encounters and possible friction. Right. In the sense that these call centers for either computer companies or airline industries are actually being circulated in India, and the U.S. sort of traveler or the U.S. computer user is actually calling these call centers in India. Right. I'm going to give you a brief anecdote in regards to of ways course. in which my luggage was displaced or lost in a different airport on the East Coast, and I had to call the call center from United, which was in India. And uh, even though my luggage was supposedly five miles away, and I had to talk to the, I had to talk to the person 10,000 miles away sure. to try to locate it, right. that person, unfortunately, was, was incapable of giving me a local contact. Mm -hmm. Of course, this ensued in my incredible frustration right. uh, with the situation. I was wondering in terms of, you've talked about grooming in mm -hmm. terms of training, but mm -hmm. I was wondering also in terms of cross-cultural encounters, how do how do the Indian IT worker, call center worker, deals with the, this kind of U.S. traveler? Right. Which can be very rude. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, I'm sure Sahana would have, Sahana would have uh, more to say on this. But um, you know, ever since the politicization of the outsourcing issue in the U.S., um, Indian call center workers have actually had to deal with a lot of abuse. You know, a, a lot of verbal abuse. Um, and you know, there's two sides of it, as you pointed out. I mean, it truly is frustrating. The same things happen to me. Um, you know, on the consumer side, um, to deal with this. And of course, this is a, a point where, as a political economist, you can't, even though you know it's the fault of the giant faceless corporation, you're talking to a person, right? And so there is there is that aspect of it. Um, in India, there have been increasing. Um, uh, you know, the, the workers have basically had to. Uh, be more attentive to um, hiding their identity, to coming up with ways of masquerading where they are in relation to um, their customers. Um, and you know, there's real, um, there's, uh, there's, there's a. This is one of the ways in which the costs of this kind of labor can be very psychologically damaging and difficult. Yeah, so. Um, uh, that's been very much that's been very much the case in the Indian context. Yeah, there's a lot of anonymity. Like I don't know if you've any of you have tried this, but when you get a telemarketer, if you ask them, you know, where they're based, in many many, which I always do, um, in in many cases they will say, uh, we're not allowed to um, tell you. And of course, they often have the Americanized names, etc. Um, and the, you know, the accent, you're not quite sure where to place, etc. But you know. The, there was a famous incident in, in the US a few years ago where one of these shock jock radio programs um, called a call center worker in India and then just you know verbally abused her um, on the on on air. And this was this was of course drove up ratings. This was in Philadelphia. This happened I think four years ago and I write about it in one of my articles. Um, and so and, and that was played in all sorts of, you know, xenophobic websites um, to sort of like let's get back at them kind of thing so yeah I mean there are th definitely that's that's part one part of that that story was that you talk calling her no I'm just kidding <laughs> thanks that was a great presentation um, I, I don't know much about India but I was fascinated by that video you showed and especially beginning with these uh, windmills that rise like natural industrial flora from the Indian countryside <laughs> And that's beautiful. What I was wondering about is um, what's the relationship of the people on whose land those windmills are placed to the labor that produces the windmills, that maintains the windmills, that maintains the electric distribution lines, and also with the reaper. I thought, well, who's driving that reaper? Um, who owns that reaper? Um, is this a large agribusiness firm we're talking about here? So. Um, I was just wondering, kind of, how, because there's a certain friction there, right? Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, one of the hallmarks of modernity, according to, you know, Eric Hobsbawm, is the destruction of the peasantry, which right. happens in different places in different ways, right? Right. So as you're watching these incredibly glamorous images, yeah. what you're also seeing is a certain amount of just brutal destruction, on right. the other hand, right, which kind of goes to the comment you, you made earlier, well, the, the poster on the, the blog made yeah. earlier, right? Um, so anyhow, what is the relationship? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. do you, does the peasantry ever get to work for these corporations? <laughs> well, I mean, I, that's a very beautifully put question. And absolutely, that th this process has been extremely violent in terms of moving people off the land. And you know, 
I looked at one, one side of conflict, which is you know, access to education, access to employment. Another very real side of conflict is access to land, access to jobs in the, in the land, you know, that, that sort of violent movement of, of, uh, of the rural working force as their land is being commodified. Um, it, it has been violent. You know, there, has been, there have been violent, um, uh, violent um, opposition, but then also extremely brutal repression by the state. Um, one area that I've been looking at, which has actually been a tragic, a tragic area for me to study as someone with left-leaning sympathies in India, which has been what the communist government in West Bengal has done um, in the last few years um, in terms of brutally repressing um, peasant uprisings against one of the companies that's actually shown here, which is the, you know, the company that's making the Nano, which is the, the new Indian um, $2,000 car, which is supposed to be the people's car, um, the factory for which is based in West Bengal. And there was um, in two, uh, there were two separate cases, but one around the, the you know, putting up of this factory in a village um, where uh, peasant groups um, opposed, and there was a protest, and um, the government opened fire, you know, and, and um, workers um, in a communist state were uh, not workers, peasants were, were shot down. Um, and there was, you know, this has been a huge, and of course the Indian media loved nothing more than communists gone bad on their own people, you know, communists being hypocritical. And so there, this issue, the, the, the village is called Nandigram, and Singur is the other uh, village very close to uh, Calcutta where this happened um, last year. This has actually caused this national, international debate. People like Noam Chomsky wrote in support of the communist government saying that, you know, even that uh, sometimes we have to look the other way to, you know, even comrades have to develop as the China's case um, shows us, et cetera. Um, so yes, it's been brutal, and it's, it's, it's turned political um, allies and foes on their, on their heads, because even the left has made arguments for rapid economic development, right? And so then who represents uh, the poor becomes an, an issue, and certainly in terms of institutional politics. One can't say that it is the left, the, the official left parties anymore. The other side of this is in India today, there's a huge insurrection um, of, um, of um, you know, the, the, the left that defines themselves as Maoists. Um, uh, the Naxalite violence in India, in, um, in, in many parts of India, is, is brutal against this kind of development. And, so, and that's not a, a clear-cut story of resistance either. There's a lot of violence by those groups, and there's violence, again, by the state against those groups. So um, there is a larger story of violence going on here. Um, that you're right. You should have seen the blood behind the happy images, <laughs> as you did. Thanks, Paul. Okay.